Welcome to a video on modeling data with exponential log and quadratic functions. So what we're going to do in this video is we're going to look at exponential functions, log functions, and graph those, and then come up with models using exponential and log functions. And then the same thing with graphing quadratics and quadratic models. And then looking at the scenario web, what, what are our data looks like and coming up with the, the function that we should use to model that data. Alright, data doesn't always fall perfectly into a line or into a perfect pattern, but a lot of times there's a trend in the data which means that even though it's not perfect, some type of a geometric figure may uh, do a pretty good at describing the trend. So this is called a scatter plot. So a scatter plot is kind of like, I don't know, like target practice. You know, somebody's shooting a gun and these, these dots are going all over the place. But we're seeing a trend in the data. You know, yeah, that we can't have anything go through all the points because it would just be zigzagged and all over the place. But what we're seeing here is low percentages of adult females uh, who are literate corresponds to high mortality rates for, for infants, but high percentages of literacy has a low infant mortality. So we're seeing a trend in the data. And a line, even though it doesn't go through every single point, it does a pretty good job of describing the trend that we see. And then what we can do with that line, the blue line, is estimate. So if I had a country, each one of these points is a country. Um, and some country has, you know, this particular point has about 45% uh, literacy and about 120 uh, uh, deaths per thousand. Uh, and we could estimate, you know, if we had a gap, like right here we got a gap. What if the literacy rate was 55%? Well, we could use the height of that line around 125 per 1,000 to be the mortality rate. So that's what these trends lines do is they give us a, a kind of a guess, a, a good prediction where we might fall. All right, um, that's a, a scatter plot and we use this line, the blue line, it's called a regression line that we're using to describe the trend that we're seeing. All right, now one of the things that we use to describe trends that it's not linear uh, many times is, is exponential uh, function, exponential growth or exponential decay. So when we have uh, an exponential function, we have something that looks like a number to a variable power. The, the exponent is what is allowed to change. But the B, the base, is just some positive number. And we restrict it to positives because we're going to let X be anything. And we can't have negative numbers raised to fraction, fractional powers, certain fractional powers. And then we don't allow 1 to be included because 1 to any power is 1. And that would just be boring. So B is a positive number. It's not 1. And X can be anything. So that's an exponential function. Now what would that look like if we graphed it? Well, the graph of y equals 2 to the x, we can plug in some numbers for x. So 2 to the negative 3, sorry, that should be a 1 eighth right there. 2 to the negative 3 is an eighth. 2 to the negative 2 is a fourth. Two. Remember your properties of exponents. When you have negative exponents, that goes down to the denominator and becomes positive. So 2 to the third is 8, but it's down in the denominator. So there's a 1 over that 8. 2 to the second is 4. But because it's negative, there's a 1 over that 4, okay? So negative powers, we end up with fractions. And the positive powers, we end up with bigger numbers, numbers that get bigger than 2 uh, as we get bigger and bigger past 1, okay? Um, we can graph these. Again, if you have a graphing calculator, you can just type in y equals, and clear all these out, y equals 2 to the x. And you would type that like this, 2 caret x, and then graph it. All right, and you would see that it just bends and it just starts going up on the other side there. 
Again, if you don't have a graphing calculator, remember you can use Desmos. Y equals 2, and then you hit Shift 6 on your keyboard. Notice that we went up high like that. And then we just type X, and there's that curve. We can zoom out and see um, it kind of just hugs the X axis, and then it just takes off. As soon as we get past the Y axis, it bends upward and it almost goes vertical because it grows so fast. All right, all right, and then we can plot those points, and there's that curve, there's that curve that we see. I right, always connect these with smooth lines, not, not connecting the dots with straight lines. All right, now let's look at this. Here we got a graph, and it says, um, this, is, this is the bar graph, this is a, a scatter plot, and it wants us to compare an exponential and a linear model. Okay, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to enter these numbers. I used this in the last video. I'm going to enter these numbers into Excel. And I'm going to ask Excel to give me a linear than an exponential model. So the way I'm going to do it, remember, we put the X coordinates here, the Y coordinates here. So I'm going to put years after 1950 here. So just like that last one, we want to put in years after um the, the very first date that they give us, and then those y coordinates from here. So I'm putting in, so 1950, I'm putting in 0, 1960, I'm putting in 10, 20, 30, so on and so on. And then these are the y coordinates that I'm plugging in there. All right, then just like the last one, I'm going to highlight all the data, insert, scatter plot, right, right click any data point, add trend line, all right, and I'm going to tell it to give me the equation and the r squared value and I'm going to move that over here so we can see right now it is 0 0.9932 almost perfect all right r squared of 1 is perfect I mean it hits every point exactly right through the center all right but it has like a little slight upward bend here so if I right click and I format the trend line all right right click on the actual line on the point uh, I can change that to exponential and watch what happens with the model. So notice it changed. So I'm going to move this down here so we can actually get a snapshot of the models. So here is the linear, here is the exponential. And R squared is kind of a measure how well it does. And so we got a 0 0.9932, 0 0.9934. So the higher the number, closer it is to 1, the better the model. So 0.9934. Just slightly better. Exponential models can bend upward like this. Linear models lines don't bend, so it can't handle that slight, slight, slight bend that we see. So that's why we're seeing just a tiny little bit of an improvement. It's virtually straight after that first point, uh, but there is that slight bend. So we're getting a little bit closer with the exponential model, but not not that much better. All right, but above it, that's the actual model that we come up with that we're seeing here. So these are the two models. This is a slightly different model. It would give you the same thing. Um, Excel returns a, uh, if you can see it, Excel returns E as the base, base E, the natural base. We'll get into that again in a little bit. Uh, but your calculator and other software just returns uh, any number you know bigger than one if it's growing like that uh, so you get the same thing if you plug the numbers for X you, you're gonna get the same thing that that this model gets uh, it's just that they've changed the base E rather than the, the base that, it, that we're gonna see on this next slide um, this 2.577 again Excel is giving us 2.6203 but it's E to the 0 0.0168, slightly different look to it, but it's, going to, it's still going to give you the same thing uh, that this thing gives. So what it was wanting this to do in part A is to, or part B, how well does the model work in the year 2000? Well, this is years after 1950. So how many years after 1950 is um, 2000? So we're going to plug in uh, 51 because it's years after 19 sorry after 1949 so we're going to plug in 51 
and that's going to give us if I plug in 51 it's going to give us by uh, 6.1 in the linear model plugging into the exponential model it still gives us virtually the same thing so in 2000 there's hardly any difference in the two all right but if we go in uh, part C is asking us what about 2026 uh, the world population expects to reach H 8 billion there which function gives us a better uh, closer to 8 billion so 77 2026 is 77 years after 1949 so we plug in at 77 there so plugging into the linear model we get 8 plugging into the exponential model though we get a much higher number so because 8 billion is the projection the linear model is doing a little bit better so that means we're a little bit closer to linear growth right now than we are exponential growth all right um e that number that i was talking about that excel outputs e is uh called the natural base it has very important properties for calculus not not that big of a deal for this course but again if you ever go into the calculus uh, direction you'll see this number a whole 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 lot we'll see it a little bit in this course but not nearly as much as you would do in a calculus course so when things um, grow or, or decay exponentially um, again some pieces of software like your calculator will use any number as the base but other pieces of software like Excel use E as the base so um, when we see things like this E is being used um, uh, as the base it's not like a, a random variable that can be solved for it is a number so E is uh, an irrational number it's kind of like pi and the fact that it's a decimal it just keeps on going and it never falls into a pattern so that natural base we're using it here to model um, risk right so it's like the risk of having a car accident so X is our concentration of, of blood alcohol level and then the risk is what we're measuring what we're quantifying uh, for each value that X goes up okay so this question is asking us what's the risk what's R when the blood alcohol which is X is 0 0.08 so it's asking us to plug 0 0.08 in for that X so if I plug in 0 0.08 in there and plug that in to your calculator or Excel or whatever piece of software you want to use, you'll get 16.6658, which is roughly 16.7%. So R is a risk and percentage is like a kind of like a, a probability. Uh, but as that 0 0.08 as that number gets bigger and bigger and bigger remember these bases when the base is higher than one these things go upward so the higher that x value is the higher this thing's going to be we're just going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger as we go through and do that so anyway that's um exponential growth with e as your base okay now a log function a logarithm is it's kind of like the inverse, it's kind of like the opposite of an exponential. So b to the y equals x, that's exponential. A log, it kind of switches things around. The exponent is y, and now the exponent is isolated by itself. Okay, a logarithm is an exponent. So the, the logarithm is the exponent. Now notice the base is the base of the logarithm. That was the base of the exponent before. And the thing that was by itself in the exponential form, like the, the, the output of the exponential form, is now the input in the logarithm. Okay, so what this means, if you're uh, trying to kind of make heads or tails of it, just to kind of give you a, a better idea of what a logarithm is, like we know 5 to the first power is equal to 5, right? This means 5 one time. And we know 5 to the second power is equal to 5 times 5, which is 25. Okay, but notice over here, 
We skipped a whole lot of numbers. We went from 5 all the way up to 25. We skipped, for instance, we skipped um, 13. You know, that was the number we passed over. Well, we didn't pass over any numbers here. We didn't pass over any whole numbers, that is. But we did pass over decimals and fractions and all kinds of other numbers between 1 and 2. So the, thing, the idea is 5 to the first is 5, 5 to the second is 25. Well, what do I raise 5 to? What exponent do I put up here to get 13? Some number that's not a perfect power of 5. It's just not 5 to a whole number of power. What would that number be? Well, the answer is a logarithm. So what do I raise 5 to to get 13? I raise it to the log base 5 of 13. Right? If I raise 5 to the log base 5 of 13, I get 13. Okay, That's what a logarithm is. It's basically trying to come up with what, what is this missing exponent that will give us this number. Okay, now the way we find this number, again, if it's not a perfect whole number, if it's not one or two or three or four or a half or, you know, like a, a, a fraction like that, then we have to round this. It's going to be some type of a decimal. And the way we find it with our calculators is to type in the log of the number that we're wanting to get to, the 13, the log of 13 and divide by the log of the base, the log of 5. All right, so I get 1.5937, roughly. Okay, now what that means is that's what I raised 5 to to get 13. So 5 raised to the power of 1 1.5937 is going to be pretty close to 13. It's not perfect because we rounded, but it's pretty close. All right, so that's what a logarithm is. It's a way to uh, come up with an exponent on a base to get any output we want if that output is not like a perfect whole number power. All right, it allows us to get other, other powers that we're not... Um, you know, we, we don't know as well. We don't know what those uh, exponents are because they're not whole numbers. Not everything is a whole number. That's why logarithms exist. Now, the law, if I'm going to graph a logarithm, the way we graph these things is to use the fact that we can kind of invert these things, flip them around, and we're going to use like the exponential form because it just makes it easier and to deal with logarithms. So again, when I have a log equation, remember this is the base, this is the exponent. So 2 to the y equals x. That's where this is coming from. So remember, x is left and right, and y is the power. So I know it's, it's kind of backwards from what you're used to doing. You used to pick x and then figure out what y is. But well, the way this is written, it's easier to pick y and then figure out what x is, just because we can do two powers. So I can do things like negative two and negative one. I can pick values for for y and um, figure out what x is, and that's what we've done here. We we pick values for y, and then we have plugged it in to figure out what x is. So negative two goes in, and then we just did the same thing we did with the exponentials earlier, it's just now notice that the points are flipped around the other way. The x coordinates are now the old y coordinates. And that's the way it is with inverse functions. These are inverses of one another. They kind of undo each other. And that's why we're seeing a graph that looks like the inverse of what we saw before. This is what we saw previously. All right, and notice all the points on this now being inverted, meaning that x coordinates becoming the y coordinate, the y coordinates becoming the x coordinate. We're flipping these points around and we're getting this graph. Okay, so a logarithm, you just end up with a different, you end up with kind of an a, a exponential function, but it's been flipped 
kind of been flipped over and um, the, all the x-coordinates and y-coordinates have changed places. All right, notice here on this question I've got um, a data set and there's giving me a scatter plot. Um, if I plot these in again with Excel like I've done before, I can highlight the data, insert a scatter plot like we've been doing, and then I can, now I see a downward trend that kind of looks like the that log graph that we just saw. I want to right click a data point, add a trend line. Okay. This time I'm going to, because logarithms have that, that bending downward look, I'm going to click logarithmic and tell it to give me the equation. I always click on R squared. Sometimes you won't need R squared, but I'll just click it by default because it tells us how good of a model it is. This is almost a perfect model, 0.999. So it's almost hitting every point directly in the center. It just misses this one a little tiny bit. But there's our answer, our, our logarithm that it's giving us. Now, um, that's the same thing that your calculator gets, the output. If your calculator gave it to you, it has a different look to it than Excel does, but it's still saying that A, the, the first number is negative 11.63 roughly, and B is 13.4 roughly. That's the same thing Excel is giving us right here. It's just given in reverse. It's given the LN first, and then the other numbers second. Okay, so there's the model, and then use this model to come up with the nearest 50 degrees. How, uh, after 50 minutes. So that just means I'm going to plug in for that X right there or with Excel that X right there. I'm going to plug in 50 and um, and simplify. Alright, so plug in 50 you can just type it directly into your calculator you get about 41. So about 41 degrees after 50 minutes. Okay. And it does a very good job, so I would expect that to be really close um, because also all the other points were so close. All right, and then lastly, quadratics. A quadratic function is just a um, little bit more than a linear. Remember, linear was mx plus b. So here's like the linear part, and then we got this squared term in addition to that. So we can't have the squared term go away, or we, we'd, we'd be right back with a line. So a quadratic function just has a square term as the highest power. And then the graph of a quadratic function is called a parabola. You've probably seen parabolas before. They're those U-shaped graphs. And then the highest or lowest point on the graph is called a vertex. So there's the vertex, the low point. There's the vertex here, a high point that opens downward. All right, if A, the leading number, the leading coefficient is negative, it opens down. If the leading coefficient is positive, it opens up. Okay, so there is a parabola, parabolic graph. That right, the vertical line that's going through the center of the parabola or through the vertex is called the axis of symmetry. It's where we can fold the parabola over. It's just a vertical line, so it always have a look of um, x equals whatever the the vertex's x coordinate is. Right, the vertex, the location of that x coordinate will always be, if you have it in this ax squared plus bx plus c form, the vertex's x coordinate will always be minus b over 2a. So if you ever are told to find the maximum or the minimum, the low point or the high point, you'll do that via minus b over 2a. All right, and if we want to graph these things, uh, a parabola, if we, if we know the equation, the easiest thing to know is, is to look and, and know if we're going to go upward or downward by just glancing at the x squared term. If it's positive, it's opening up. If it's negative, it's opening down. Okay, and then we can find the vertex by minus b over 2a. That'll give us the x coordinate. All right, and then to get the y coordinate, we just figure out what that minus b over 2a is and then plug it in for the x. And remember, that gives us y. All right, so that'll give us the vertex that'll give us that point and then we, we need three points you need two points to make a line we need three points to make a parabola so typically what we do is is use the x-intercepts and the vertex together as those three points and then we can use uh, the y uh, intercept as well 
uh, as either a fourth point or on the rare occasion like the vertex may be um, an x-intercept then we would definitely need uh, another point so sometimes that y-intercept is not a additional point it's like a fourth point sometimes it may be a second or uh, or the third point right, and then we uh, plot the intercepts the vertex together connect those with a smooth curve and just continue the pattern uh, out from those points All right and also you can use technology to help you, you can use Desmos here calculator to help you with this All right if I want to graph this quadratic all right, I would find the uh, vertex, I would find the x-intercepts, and again, Desmos does a beautiful job uh, with these things. So let me pull this back so we can see it. So y equals x squared. When you're using Desmos, one of the things you got to get used to is shift 6 does the exponent. After you type the squared, you have to press the right arrow key to get out of the exponent, get that cursor back down on the main line minus 2x minus 3 right and then I'm going to zoom way 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 back in because I zoomed out earlier and notice what it gives me it gives me the vertex right and it gives me the y-intercept and the x-intercepts okay the Desmos is a great 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 tool for helping uh, do this okay but how do I do that by hand well minus b over 2a so I'll just plug in um, a is 1 b is negative 2 c is negative 3 and then I plug those numbers in so the x coordinate of the vertex is 1 I plug in 1 for the x in the uh, original equation and just carry out the order of operations I get y is negative 4 so that means the vertex is 1 negative 4 All right and then to get your x-intercepts you remember you set y equal to zero so y is equal to zero then I have to factor so remember factoring we're looking for two numbers that multiply to negative three add to negative two so that's negative three and positive one so that means now I set each of these two factors equal to zero and solve those so now we're solving linear equations just like in the last section so add three over subtract that should sorry that should be a negative one subtract the one over so x equals 3 and x equals negative 1 are locations of x-intercepts. Okay, so again, Desmos found those points. Um, there's the algebraic method to find those points. Y-intercept, we plug 0 in for x. So that's a 0, that's a 0, minus 3, so minus 3 is the only thing left over. So there's the y-intercept. All right, so there's what I graphed. And again, Desmos will, will give you the, the special points for graphs. Uh, it'll find those for you too. So Desmos is a free tool online uh, available to you. Just type in Desmos, uh, search it, and then and just bring it up. I would bookmark that, especially for the beginning part of this course. All right, and then if we want to come up with what's a appropriate function, we you know which model is going to be the best. Um, linear does uh, great if things just line up perfect linear pattern, like we saw earlier exponential we want b to be greater than one if, if the graph is kind of bending uphill left to right so if it's if it's doing something like this and getting higher and higher and higher all right and then if it's going downhill it's increasing but it's slowing down then that would be a log function so it's going up but it's kind of decreasing how it goes up that's a log logarithm and then if it decreases and then increases or increases then decreases that's typically quadratic decreases and increases increases and decreases that's our quadratic models okay so anyway Excel when you are picking if you have data and you're picking what um, trend line works best Excel gives you a reminder right exponential the data kind of needs to be going uphill logarithmic it kind of needs to be going uphill but slowing as it goes uphill linear everything kind of falls in a straight line and then polynomial um, that's quadratic but we have to keep it order two order two means uh, the highest power is two so it polynomials can bend multiple times right but uh, the degree 
or order is going to be that highest power. So quadratic would just be 2. All right. We don't get into the higher, you know, all the way up through 6 in this course. We just kind of keep it at 2.